Hello and welcome to session three of our summer school and looking at boy at the back of the class. Okay, so let's have a little bit of a review. So even though this is quite an easy read and it's quite a simplistic novel because it's written from the perspective of a child, the author has actually quite cleverly challenged our misconceptions that we may have. So let's just have a look at um, this section here where the narrator is asking about what a refugee is. So let, I'll just read this section to you. Exactly, my love. They were what people call refugees and children like the new boy in your class are called refugee kids because they've had to leave their homes and travel very far to try and find a new house to live in. Do you mean like Dina? I asked, wondering if Dina was going to be called a refugee kid in her new school too. She had to move to Wales because her mum and dad couldn't find a house in London. So we've got two interesting things going on here. So these are both children that have had to move house, but they're having to move for different reasons. Dina's reason for moving though is also a challenging one because clearly this is about the cost of living in Britain and the cost of living in London. So Dina's family couldn't afford to remain in where they called their home and had to leave, but they have the luxury of that choice and that's the difference. So underneath the extract there, I would like you to have a go at answering that question in your own words. What is the actual difference between Ahmet and Dina? So think about the actual, the difference in privilege that the, both these children have. Okay, because that's what the narrator is really trying to get to. What is the difference in their privilege? So answer that question now. Okay, so in today's speech, we're going to revise how to punctuate direct speech, which is a massive skill in year nine that we need to master and when we go into our GCSEs, and we're going to look at how we might use evidence to support our answers. So the success criteria of that is that you can identify direct speech within a text. You can perfectly punctuate direct speech from characters. That's massively important as a skill to get a grade four at GCSE, and that you can support your ideas with quotations with evidence from the text. So today we're going to be looking at three chapters, six, seven and eight. Chapter six, the woman in the silver scarf. Chapter seven, Mr. Iron's nose. Chapter eight, the unexpected adventure. There are one, two, three, six big words that we need to look at today. So we're going to start with those. OK, so the first word is Kurdish. Now, I had to look this up because I didn't really understand what language they spoke, spoke in Syria because there's more than one. So Kurdish is an adjective or noun because it can it's a language, but also um, it describes a person. So Kurdish can mean the language of the people they call the Kurds or things related to Kurds. So, for example, you could have Kurdish food. So Kurdish can describe a type of food, which is why it's also an adjective. So Kurds from come Kurdistan. So Armat speaks a language called Kurdish. So see if you can use that word in a sentence of your own. Syria. I am not a geographer, guys. You'll soon discover this about me, or those of you who already know me will know that. Syria is a country in the Middle East and the continent of Asia. Okay, the capital of Syria is Damascus. So Ahmet is from a country called Syria. Smirking. Now, this is a really interesting verb. I'm very keen on verb choices. So for example, Brendan the bully might smile, but smile is something I do, okay? A smirk is when someone's smiling in an irritating, smug way. It's not a happy smile. It's kind of a mean smile. So other synonyms for smirk are smile smugly or snigger. So choosing correct vocab is really important. And as predicted, it's in to do with Brendan the bully. I could see Brendan the bully smirking again, but this time at me. The word border. So border is a noun and it's an invisible but official line separating different countries is called a border. So, for example, there is a border between England and Wales. There's a border between England and Scotland. It's an invisible line, but on one half of the side of that line, you're in one country and on the other side of that line, you're in another. So you could be have one foot in both places and you could be in England and Wales at the same time. So synonyms for that are frontier, boundary, partition, dividing line. So the example from the text is this atlas is a little old, but I don't think the borders have changed that much. Okay, conundrum, this is a really good word. 
when you've got a confusing or difficult problem, you call it a conundrum. So synonyms for that are problem, quandary, riddle, enigma, brain twister. So if you've got a particularly difficult situation that you're not sure what to do, you might have a bit of a conundrum. So last year, I had to learn the word conundrum for a spelling test and the word exotic. So that's an adjective. Something exotic comes from somewhere far away and mysterious. So um, exotic is something that you won't find typically in England. It will be from another country, someone very far away. So synonyms for exotic are foreign, unfamiliar, distant, remote, tropical, and exotic fruit like dates and pomegranate. So a pomegranate is, um, I think I've only had one when I was a small child, really, or on a, you sometimes get them on salads. They're like an apple shaped fruit, so feel free to look that one up if you're not used to it. But pomegranates have become quite important in this novel. So, what I'd like you to do is go to your vocab sheets and use those words in sentences of your own before we move on. So, pause the video now. Okay, so let's read chapter six The Woman in the Silver Scarf. As soon as I got to the bus stop the next day, I told Josie and Tom and Michael everything my mum had told me about refugee kids and about how the new boy had probably had to get on a boat with no toilets on it so they could run away from bombs and all the other bad things that the bullies had done to his country. But my dad said refugee kids are dangerous and that they lie and steal things, said Josie, looking confused. He told me to stay away from the new boy and not to talk to him because he was probably a criminal. Can you imagine that? It's a child's being considered a criminal at 10. A child who's clearly terrified of the country where he's come to. No wonder he's terrified if people think things like that. But my mum and dad said we should be extra nice to him. Look, and opening up his rucksack, Tom showed us a big bag of sweets. Mum said to give these to him at lunchtime. And she said we had to be nice to him and not to ask too many questions. And this is where... The children are having a bit of a conundrum here, aren't they? Because who should they believe? Which parents should they believe? My mum said the same, said Michael, as we got on the bus to school. Except she told me to give him a banana. And my dad said refugee kids were running away from the war that's on the television all the time. He didn't say anything about bullies. We all looked over at Josie, who was chewing on the ends of her hair and frowning. She didn't see anything, but I knew she was thinking that her dad must have made a mistake. There was no way the new boy could be dangerous or a criminal, not when he was the same size as us and he had just run away from bullies and a real war. Mr Thompson had taught us all about wars last year. It had been a special year for wars and Mrs Sanders said it was our duty not to forget about them. We learned about red poppies and how they were for the most important flower because they grew on soldiers' graves and about how lots of countries had joined up to find it, fight in the very first war. The upper years did an assembly about it and we went on a special day trip to the Tower of London where the Queen keeps her crown because that's where millions of red poppies have been put in its gardens and got stuck on its walls. Mr Thompson said, we should never forget how many people have died in wars to save us, but I can't remember long numbers, especially ones that keep going up all the time, but I'll never forget the castle. It had looked like it was bleeding, and later on that day, a man who knew all about the first big war gave us an extra special lesson inside the castle. His name was Officer Denny. I remember him because his name rhymed with my uncle Lenny's. Everyone liked him because he was funny and knew everything there was to know about bombs and uniforms and a sad place called Flanders Fields. He picked me and Michael to try and hold up a rucksack that was the same size and weight as a real soldier's rucksack, but it was so big and heavy that we couldn't even lift it off the ground. Remembering Officer Denny's, Officer Denny's rucksack made me wonder if the new boy had to carry lots of heavy things in his rucksack when he was running away. Maybe that's why it looked so old and dusty. He still didn't have a new one, but that week he had started to wear the school uniform. He must have found the new shirt and jumper itchy because he kept pulling at the collar whenever he thought no one was looking. That day, the bus to school was late and got stuck in so much traffic that the driver let everyone get off early. We had to run half the way, and by the time we got to the playground, the bell had started ringing. I was hot and sweaty and feeling icky when we got into class, so I didn't realise that everyone was quieter than usual. But after a few minutes, I noticed that Pavinda and Dean, who were very clever at everything and sat at the front of the class, kept looking over their shoulders. At first, I thought they were looking at me because my face was still red, but then I heard Pavinda say, wonder who she is? I turned around and saw a grown-up sitting in Clarissa's seat, and not just any grown-up, but one who was talking to the new boy, and the new boy was talking back to her. I poked Josie in the arm and said, look. Josie turned around and whispered, where's Clarissa? 
We looked around the classroom and then saw that Clarissa was sitting at the end of the our row on Felicity and Natasha's table. She looked much happier. Hurry up and settle down, please, said Mrs. Khan. And she picked up the register. Before we head to assembly, I want to introduce someone very special to you, but let's make sure you're all here first. After she had finished calling everyone's names, Mrs. Khan said, Now, class, I want you all to say good morning to Mrs. Hemsey, our new class assistant. Miss Hemsey stood up and smiled at everyone. Good morning, Mrs. Hemsey, we all said. Half the class shouted it out, and the other half said it quietly, as if they weren't sure Mrs. Khan had given them the right name to say. I shouted it out. I like shouting out new names. It makes them feel more real. Mrs. Hemsey smiled and said, good morning, everyone. Mrs. Hemsey will be helping Ahmet with his lessons from now on. If we're very lucky, in a few weeks, she'll be helping Ahmet do a presentation about his hometown and how he feels about living here in London. Everyone turned to stare at Mrs. Hemsey as she nodded and smiled and then sat back down. She looks nice, whispered Josie. I like her scarf. And I looked back over my shoulder because I liked the scarf Mrs. We Hemsey was wearing on her head too. It looked like a silver river and had a diamond pin clipped on one of the sides that looked like a star. She had one of those smiles where the person smiling never shows any teeth, but I liked it. And her smile looked like they'd been drawn around with thick black pencil. And her eyes, sorry, looked like they'd been drawn around with thick black pencil, which made them look bigger and more interesting. The new boy seemed to like her too. And when she sat back down, she whispered something to him and patted him on the back, which made him nod. I felt happy for him. He had someone to talk to and he didn't have to sit next to Clarissa anymore. It's much nicer to sit next to someone who isn't always trying to get away from you all the time and has a diamond pin in her scarf. All that day, the new boy did his lessons at the back of the class and at break time and lunchtime, he went to seclusion as usual. But maybe because Mrs. Hemsey was with him, he didn't look at the ground so much and he seemed more interested in everything we were doing. I caught him staring at me and Josie twice before lunchtime and three whole times in the afternoon and I was sure he wanted to be friends with us now. At home time, we waited just as we always did by the gates, but this time all of us had something to give him. Josie had saved her chocolate yoghurt pudding from her lunchbox for him especially, and Michael had, and Tom had the bag of sweets and the banana their mums and dads had told them to save. Today, I had an apple to give him because the school canteen had run out of oranges, but it was okay because Tom had given me a sticker of a whale to put on, so it was still very special. As we were waiting, I crossed my fingers and secretly hoped that Mrs. Hemsey would come out with the new boy too, because since she could speak to him properly, she would be able to ask him some of my 11 questions. The playground had started to empty by the time the new boy finally came out, holding both Mrs. Hemsey's and Mrs. Khan's hand. As they made their way over to the woman in the red scarf, Michael whispered, come on. I could tell he was excited because his eyes had gotten wider. Michael's eyes always get wider when we can't wait to do something. We all ran over to the new boy and gave him our gifts. This is from me, said Tom, holding out the large bag of sweets like it was a trophy. There are real cola bottles in there and flame wispies and some toffee melts there too. And this is from me, said Josie, holding out the chocolate pudding. It's my favourite. Uh, this is just a banana, but look, said Michael, turning it over to show the new boy the row of stick men he'd drawn on it. And this is from me, I said, holding out the apple. The new boy looked up, his arms full, and gave us each a happy nod. I could tell it was a happy nod and not just an ordinary nod because even though his mouth wasn't smiling, his lion eyes looked happy. Miss Hemsey bent down and said something in a foreign language in the new boy's ears. He nodded and then looking up at us said very slowly, thank you, friends. Josie, Michael, Tom and me nodded and beamed and then all at once started talking. Do you want to come play with us, uh, play football with us tomorrow, shouted Tom, at break time. I'll get you another one of those puddings tomorrow if you like them, exclaimed Josie. I'll ask Mum to give something better than a banana, cried out Michael. What about some mini muffins? And I'm going to get something better than an apple tomorrow. What's your favourite fruit, I asked. The new boy looked up at us and then looked at Miss Hemsey and Mrs Khan and then at the woman in the red scarf. They were all smiling and the woman in the red scarf ruffled his hair just like my mum had ruffled my hair the night before. Now kids, said Mrs Khan, bending down so that her face was the same height as ours. These are all wonderful gifts and I know Armit is thankful for them, but he needs us to learn a little bit more English before he can answer your questions, okay? We all looked at each other and then Mrs Khan and then nodded. But I do think it's a very good idea of yours, Tom. Maybe Armit would like to play football with you tomorrow at break time. Mrs. Khan looked over at Mrs. Hemsey, who gave a nod. Yes, that's a very good idea. Awesome, said Tom. And he was so excited that he gave the new boy a thump on the arm. 
The new boy looked at Tom and then his arm as if he wasn't quite sure what had just happened. And there's no need to give him so many presents every day, said the woman in the red scarf, laughing. It's so lovely, but we don't want to rot our mate's teeth now, do we? We all shook our heads. If you still want to give him something at home time, just choose one thing between you and that'll be more than enough, OK? We all nodded and then I cried out, Miss Hemsey, I hadn't meant to say it so loudly, but I was so excited at the thought of having one of my questions answered that I couldn't help myself. Yes, smiled Miss Hemsey. Can I, uh, where is he from? Like which country? And what language does he speak? I asked, looking at the new boy. Miss Hemsey's smile widened, even though she still didn't show any of her teeth. Ahmed is from a country called Syria, and he speaks a language called Kurdish. Do you speak that and English? asked Josie, looking impressed. Yes, said Miss Hemsey. I'm Syrian too. Why doesn't Ahmet speak any English? said Tom. Well, said Miss Hemsby, because in Syria nobody needs to speak English, just like you don't need to speak a Syrian language here in England. Oh, the answer made Tom frown to himself, which meant he was asking himself lots of other questions in his head. Now, kids, off you go, said Mrs Khan, clapping her hands. Ahmet needs to get going and so do you. And Tom, I notice you're wearing your brother's trainers by mistake again. Try and make it the last time, OK? Yes, miss, said Tom, as he turned bright red. We waved goodbye and headed to our bus stop. Just before we turned the corner, I looked over at my shoulder and saw the new boy take a big bite of the apple I'd given him. I felt even happier than I did when Miss Hemsey had answered my questions. But a second later, the feeling quickly disappeared because that was when I saw Brendan the bully. He was standing in front of the boys' toilets, just a few yards away, and his cheeks were pink and his eyes were narrow, and he was watching the new boy with a scowl on his face. Everyone knows that Brendan the bully hates anyone who's different from him, but it was the first time I'd seen him look so angry and mean. He couldn't do anything because Miss Hemsmy and Miss Khan and the lady in the red scarf were there. But as we headed to our bus stop and all the way home, I couldn't help feeling worried. I think I knew right away that the scowl was a warning and that he was going to make things hard for the new boy and anyone who wanted to be friends with him. And it turns out that I was right because at first break on the very next day, that's exactly what he started doing. Okay, so some really interesting ideas that came up in The Woman in the Silver Scarf. So we've got a question here for you. So many people stereotype refugees and assume that they're going to be criminals. Why do people have these misconceptions? So in your box, on, in your booklet, I just want you to record your ideas. Why do you think people have these misconceptions about Syrian refugees or refugees in general? So, and do you know what it's called when someone prejudges a person based on a piece of information? So what is it actually called when we prejudge someone on the basis of their maybe their race, religion, you know, the country they come from. What is that called? And I just wanted to give you a little bit of an interesting fact here. So according to the New York Times, which is America's most popular newspaper, the data between 1980 and 2010 consistently reveals that immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than natural born US citizens. So that's the same in this country. So statistically, if you're an immigrant from another country, a refugee or an asylum seeker, you were less likely to commit a crime than someone born in this country. So why do then, do we have that stereotype? Where does that come from? So in the box, just make a note of what you think, what your personal ideas on that are. Okay, so today's activity is to looking at how we might punctuate direct speech. So we've got the extract here and what you'll see is where the direct speech um, is placed. So obviously it's a new speech, new line. Okay, so punctuation marks goes in between the speech. So we can see that Mrs. Khan is still speaking here. So we've not had to start a brand new line because it follows on. OK, but then when um, a new person would start speaking, we would add in a, a brand new line to show that. So let's have a look at how we might punctuate this sentence. So hurry up and settle down, please, said Mrs. Khan as she picked up the register. So the bit that Mrs. Khan has said is hurry up and settle down, please. OK, so we should have our opening speech marks, our capital H because it's the start of the speech, the exclamation mark 
before the end of the speech marks are closed, capital letters for Mrs. Khan as that's name, a comma as she puts up the register, full stop. So what I want you to have a go at is punctuating that section in your booklet. Try and do it independently and then check your answers on page 58 to 59 of your book. Okay, let's read chapter seven, Mr. Iron's Nose, and chapter eight, The Unexpected Adventure. When the bell rung for the first break the next morning, Mrs. Khan kept her promise and let the new boy out into the playground for the very first time. Tom was put in charge of looking after him, and we were all told that if he got scared or wanted to stop playing, then we were to find a teacher immediately or go and see Miss Hemsby in the staff room. I didn't know why the new boy would be scared of being in a playground or why he wouldn't want to play with us. But then I thought that maybe in his country, the bullies had been mean to him at school too. I never really thought about it before, but maybe there are bullies in everyone's playground. So I know as well from my own experience of teaching refugee children that most Syrian children don't get to go to school. It's not a safe place to be. Um, so last year I taught a young boy called Abdullah and he had never been to school. So he was 15 by the time he arrived. Um, in England and he had never physically been to school so the whole concept of school was quite scary for him and he was 15 so you can only imagine how terrifying it would be when you're 10. As Josie grabbed her football Tom tried to explain to the new boy how to play the game properly. You like this said Tom loudly pointing to the new boy then his foot and then the ball. The new boy nodded but not like this, continued Tom, shaking his head before pointing to the football and then his hand. This is stupid. He knows how to play football, said Michael. Maybe they play differently in his country. Remember when I got here and I only knew American football, protested Tom, looking at me as if he knew the answer. I shrugged. I don't know. We should have asked Miss Hemsby. Oh, come on, cried Josie as we reached the playground. Let him just try and see if he knows it. By the time we reached our usual corner of the playground, Josie and Tom had decided that the new boy would be on Josie and Michael's team. Since she was the best at football, it wouldn't matter so much if the new boy couldn't play, and because it was just Tom and me and my team, we had the first kick. After less than a minute of the game starting, the new boy began to run and dribble and do lots of tricks with the football that none of us could do yet, and within the first five minutes he had scored two goals. Whoa, said Tom, he's even better than Josie. Suddenly catching Josie's eye, he quickly added, or nearly as good anyway. Woo! cried Mount Michael as the new boy flashed me past me and Tom struck another goal. Woo! By now, a, group, a crowd was beginning to gather to watch the game and I could hear lots of upper graders and lower graders talking and saying things like, look, the dangerous kid's been allowed out. Does that mean he doesn't have a disease? But the kidnappers will be able to see him from here. And I just heard Jenny tell everyone that she was sure that she'd heard Mrs. Sanders say the new boy was a professional footballer when she suddenly cried out, ow! And before we knew what was happening, Brendan the bully and his mate, Liam and Chris, had pushed their way out onto our make-believe pitch. Josie looked at me and I looked at Tom, and Tom looked over at the new boy, who was standing next to Michael looking confused. We want to play, said Brendan the bully, a nasty smile on his face. He walked over to the new boy who had the football and kicked the ball away so hard that it ended up on the other side of the playground. The new boy took a step back. Go away, Brendan, said Josie bravely. This is our game and that's my ball. Brendan the bully turned around to look at Josie and she swallowed nervously. But just then his expression changed from mean to sad. I turned around too and so that Mr. Irons was walking towards us. What's going on here then, he said, his moustache twitching. Mr. Irons is one of the upper school teachers and is famous for being one of the strictest teachers in the schools and for never ever smiling. He has a long face, a long nose, long nips, lips and a large brown bristling moustache that he carries a tiny comb for in the front pocket of his jacket. Everyone knows about the comb because when he thinks no one is looking, he takes it out and combs his moustache with it in short, straight lines. And when he gets very angry, you can hear his nose whistle whistling. If that happens, then you know you're going to get at least one detect detention or be given a hundred lines to write. He's also the very worst teacher you can have on break duty because he hates noises, especially happy noises. Whenever he's in the playground, he walks around telling everyone off for laughing too loudly or for making fun sounds. Last year, he made a first year boy who was playing tag cry by telling him that only pigs squeal. And since the boy was squealing, he must come from a large family of pigs and should spend the rest of the break inside. And another time, Mr. Irons gave everyone cheering 
um, gave everyone cheering for handstand Hannah a hundred lines to write for being so loud, even though she was about to beat the world record for the longest handstand in history. When any, anyone sees Mr. Irons walking towards them, they always play more quietly and move away. But we had been so happy that the new boy was playing with us that we had forgotten we were in school where the were bullies bullies and teacher bullies. Please, sir, well, Brendan the bully, she won't let me play. I wanted to play and she said I couldn't. Mr. Irons tutted at Josie. That's not very nice thing to do to your friend, is it? He's not my friend, said Josie angrily, and he didn't ask. He came over and kicked our ball away. Please, sir, and that boy over there told me I could play too, added Brendan the bully, pointing at the new boy and smirking. Mr. Irons came over, looked over at the new boy and then beckoned for him to come over. The new boy looked around and then realising what was being asked to do, he walked over to where Mr. Irons was standing. Did you tell this boy he couldn't play with you? asked Mr. Irons, pointing to Brendan the bully. The new boy looked around again. Everyone else in the playground had stopped what they were doing and were listening to everything that was being said. Please, sir, Brendan's lion guy cried out, running up behind, behind the new boy. Yeah, added Michael. And he's new. And he doesn't speak. When I want your opinion, I'll ask for it. But until then, don't interrupt me again, shouted Mr. Irons. I felt my whole face go red and my tongue swell up in my mouth. I could see Brendan the bully smirking again, but this time at me. Now, boy, Mr. Irons turned to the new boy. I'll ask you again. Did you or did you not tell Brendan he couldn't play with you? The new boy stood rooted to the spot and looked over at us. But sir, I burst out. You don't understand. He can't speak. Right, shouted Mr. Irons, his nose whistling dangerously. That's detention for you, he cried out, pointing to me. And you, he added, pointing to the new boy. And you, he hissed, pointing to Michael. All three of you come, me after, come see me after school today. Until then, I'm confiscating this ball. Josie watched angrily as Liam handed the ball to Mr. Irons with a grin. And as we watched Mr. Irons walk off with the ball under his arm, the bell rang for the end of break and ben Brendan the bully smiled at us. See you at lunch then, he said, and ran off. But at lunchtime, the new boy was nowhere to be seen. And at second break, Miss Hemsby came out with him. So Brendan the bully stayed away from us. At home time, Tom had to run off to catch the bus because it was one of his brother's birthdays. The rest of us decided that instead of going to see Mr. Irons, we would go and find Mrs. Khan to see if she could help us. Even though Miss Hemsey had already spoken to her about what had happened, we also knew that she didn't know the whole story because Miss Hemsby hadn't been there. So telling the new boy to follow us, we went and spoke to Mrs Khan. She listened to us in silence and then when we were finished, she shook her head. Ridiculous, she muttered. And I think she was talking to herself. Some people just can't see past the end of their own noses. She looked up, up at us and smiled. Not to worry, all of you come with me. And as we walked to the other side of the school to reach Mr. Irons' classroom, I thought about what Mrs. Khan had said about noses and their ends. I touched my own nose and squashed it down because I didn't ever want to have a nose so big that I couldn't see what was happening at the end of it. So that's not what they meant, but obviously the narrator's a child and doesn't understand. So basically she's challenging Mr. Irons' like misconceptions and his stereotyping of this young boy here. That was probably what Miss Court made Mr. Irons give detention to people who didn't deserve it. Michael saw me and asked me what I was doing, so I told him, but he said my nose was too small and flat to ever get in the way of my eyes, so I didn't have anything to worry about. When we got to Mr. Irons' office, Mrs. Khan told us to wait outside. We couldn't hear anything except a loud buzzing, as if there were two giant bumblebees on the other side of the door. But after a minute, Mr. Irons came out and stared down at Michael, the new boy, and me with his nose thrust in the air. Maybe he was trying to see if he could see past the end of it better that way. He gave Josie her football back and didn't say anything else to us. But from that day on, whenever he saw any of us, his eyes would narrow and his nose would whistle ever so quietly. You don't really need to speak someone else's language to know when they don't like you very much. So even though the new boy couldn't speak many English words then, he knew we'd have to keep to ourselves and Josie's footballs out of the way of Mr. Irons and his horrible whistling nose. The Unexpected Adventure, Chapter 8. That weekend, I decided I wanted to ask Mum some more of my 11 questions, see if she knew the answers. I waited until Sunday morning arrived because that was when I knew Mum wouldn't be too tired and I could ask her lots of things instead of just one or two things. The only problem is I had to be extra, extra patient because every Sunday morning my mum spends at least one hour reading the Sunday morning paper. It's not a real Sunday paper because mum never buys them. She says you can buy a whole meal for the price of the Sunday paper these days and that's going to become important in a minute. Sunday paper costs about one to two pounds. 
She collects two of the biggest newspapers on the reference section of the library, and then on Saturday night she brings them all home and gets them ready for the next day. She opens them out in the centre and puts them in order so that Monday's papers are on top and Saturday's papers are on bottom, and then she folds them together like a big book. It's too heavy to hold up and read 12 big newspapers in one go, so Mum always reads it bent over the kitchen table as if she's doing homework. I don't like disturbing Mum when she's reading the paper because she only gets to do it once a week, so I quickly finished my toast and milk and silently stared at her as she finished her breakfast. But grown-ups take an awfully long time eating breakfast when they don't have to go to work, and on this morning Mum seemed to be moving so slowly that you could hardly call it moving at all. I could hear the ticking of the kitchen clock getting louder and louder and my fingers and legs getting bored of waiting. And as soon as Mum took the last bite of her toast, I decided I couldn't wait for her any longer and asked, Mum, where's Syria? The question made her look up at me straight away. What did you say, darling? Just, do you know where Syria is, Mum? I said more quietly. My mum pushed her glasses and looked at me with her head to one side. Then she said, Syria is a country very far away from here, my love. Why, why do you want to know? I shrugged. That's where the new boy in our class is from. Ah, she said, nodded. OK, tell you what, why don't you go and get the Atlas book and I'll show you. I nodded and ran to the living room, trying to remember I'd last put the Atlas book. It's hard finding a book in our house because we have so many of them. Mum loves collecting old books and reading them again and again. She takes the copies that are about to be thrown away by her library, so you can say she rescues them. The only problem is we don't really have a space for any more because our rooms are covered with piles of old books, even the toilet. The Atlas book was big and Mum always kept the very big books on the bottom shelf of our bookcase. So I climbed over the back of the sofa and crawled down into the narrow gap head first to see what was there. Luckily it was. I grabbed it and pulled it out. The Atlas book is one of the oldest books in the house and is almost half as tall as me and just as heavy. So I dragged it along behind me into the kitchen and placed it with a bang onto the kitchen table. I watched as Mum flipped the index and then to a page near the middle. Here you go, she said, turning the map around to show me. This atlas is a little old, but I don't think the borders have changed that much. I let my fingers meet hers where it said the word Syria in capital letters and looked at the strange shape of the country that the new boy had run away from. It looked like a woman yawning and wearing a tiara and whose hair was being blown in the wind, except she was all pointy. Mum, hmm, what spruits do people from Syria like most? I crossed my fingers and toes hoping that she would know the answer, because if she did, then I would know the answers to three of my original 11 questions. I'd found out where the new boy was from and what language he spoke, and as a bonus, had seen what his country looked like on a map and learned he was good at football. Well, let's see. I don't really know. I guess the same fruits we do, and exotic ones like dates and pomegranates. Your auntie Selma used to make chicken with pomegranate seeds, remember? I shook my head. Ah, well, it was quite a while ago. It was before your dad had to leave us, but I think the dish she used to make was a Syrian one. Or was it Lebanese? I can't remember, but here you see, she said, pointing to a country next to Syria, which had the word Lebanon on it. Lebanon and Syria are right next door to each other, so I guess they must eat the same kind of fruits. Can we ring and ask her? My mum smiled. I can ask her the next time she calls. Remember, she lives here now, and mum pointed to a much larger country lying above Syria called Turkey. It's a bit far and it'd be expensive to call her right now. But listen, we'll go and see her one day soon. And when we do, you can ask her and Uncle Turgay all about it in person. I nodded, but I didn't say anything because I suddenly missed my Auntie Selma an awful lot. It's funny how you can go for long bits of time without even thinking of someone and then suddenly feel all wrong because you realise they're not around anymore. I feel like that about my dad sometimes. It feels horrible when I go to bed and realise that I haven't thought about him all day, not even for a minute. But I can always remember him at night before I go to sleep, because that's when he used to tell me stories and do funny patterns on my forehead so that it tickled. It's different with my auntie Selma though, because she's not my real auntie, so I thought it might be okay if I don't think about her every day. She's my mum's best friend, because they like laughing at the same things. She has dimples just like I do, and she always wears lots of sparkling bracelets and necklaces. She used to live two floors below us with Uncle Turge, and every Sunday night they would invite Mum and Dad and me down for dinner and give us all sorts of special things to eat, like bread with spinach inside and a special kind of tea that came in a small glass and didn't have any milk in it. I remember the tea because Dad let me taste the ones, but I didn't like it at all. But then, after my dad died, Auntie Selma and Uncle Turge said they were leaving because the economy was being bad. Grown-ups are always talking about the economy, especially in shops and at bus stops and on the news, and they always sound angry or sad when they talk about it. 
I hate the economy because it made Auntie Selma and Uncle Turge suddenly disappear, just like Dad. They send us pictures and boxes of sweets sometimes in the post, and even though I like getting things from them because the stamps are interesting, I can tell it makes Mum sad. Now there's an old lady living in the flat and she never speaks to anyone. I don't think Mum could be best friends with her even if she wanted to. I thought about my question again. So people from Syria like Pomig Pom air granite, mum corrected. Remember, it's like, let's see, one half of a pom pom and a delicious letter E that you gran ate. Pom e granate. I nodded and said the word out loud three times. I loved it when mum comes up with ways to help me remember how to spell or say a word. Last year, I had to learn the word conundrum for a spelling test, but forget, kept forgetting how many nuns or ends there were in it. And then mum told me to close my eyes and picture a man called Co and a lovely nun banging on a drum. And I've never spelt it wrong since. I thought about pomegranates and how they might be Ahmed's favourite food and how we might be missing them. So I asked mum, can we get one? One what, darling? A pom e gran eight, I said carefully. Hmm, they're a bit expensive and you can't find them everywhere. How expensive? I'm not sure. About £1.50, I think. What? Nearly £2 just for one? I cried out. You could buy a whole packet of colouring pens and a rubber for that much money. Mum laughed. Yes, darling, for one. They come a long way to get to our supermarkets. And secondly, a pomegranate is a really special fruit. It's like millions of tiny fruits all hidden away inside a small ball and you can eat it for days. Oh, I said, trying to think about what millions of one fruit inside a ball would look like. She looked at me and then smiled. Do you want to see if we can find one? Shall we make it our adventure for the day? So that's really interesting, isn't it? Because the newspaper would have cost about £1.50 and mum couldn't afford to buy one. She thinks it's a waste of money and we know that there's a food shortage in their home. They suffer from food poverty. Yet mum's offered to go out and buy a pomegranate because her son wants one. You know, it shows what sort of parent she is. Um, she looked at me and smiled. Do you want to see if we can find one? Shall we make that our adventure for today? I jumped up and nodded. But can we get two, I asked. And why would you need two? I think mum already knew the answer because her lips looked like they were about to smile. I didn't think she'd tell me off, even though pomegranates are so expensive. But you can never be too sure with grown-ups. Sometimes they don't tell you off even when you've done something you know you shouldn't have. And at other times, when you think you haven't done anything bad at all, they punish you twice as much. Michael says it's so they can keep us on our toes, but I've never stood on my toes when I'm being told off, so I don't see how that works. I want to get two so I can give one to the new boy, I said. I've been giving him my sherbet lemons and sweets after school, but he didn't like them that much. But then I gave him an apple and an orange, and he liked those better. And Miss Hemsey said that he's from Syria, and that he only speaks... He only speaks... I hesitated, trying to remember what Miss Hemsey had said. Arabic? Mum asked, trying to help. I shook my head. Kurt, 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 wish, I guess, knowing I was wrong. Ah, uh, Kurdish. I nodded. I see. I could tell Mum was interested in what I was saying because she'd leaned back in her chair and folded her arms. And I thought maybe like a fruit he used to have at home all the time before the bullies dropped bombs and everything and made him run away. I stopped worried that Mum would think that I was silly and maybe a waste of money buying food that only to give it away. But she didn't. Instead, she said, I think that's a brilliant idea. Go and get ready and we'll head out on a pomegranate hunt. I got ready so quickly that morning that I think I must have beaten a world record. In five minutes, I pulled on my adventure jeans and my old Tintin jumper, put, packed my rucksack with a water bottle and an apple and a banana, put on my willies, brushed my hair and emptied my piggy bank. I had exactly four pounds and 20 pence saved up. So I took three pounds, hoping that just like my astronaut stationary sex, I could find two pomegranates that were on sale. First, we went to the fruit store that was at the bottom of our high street. It's run by a man and a woman called Mr and Mrs Marbles who like to shout, only a pound, fruit and veg, only a pound, to all the people that walk by. Their faces are always red and smiling and they wear giant square-shaped green belts around their waist which look like empty but jiggle loudly when they walk. Mrs Marbles helps people pick out the fruit they want and Mr Marbles puts them in a bag. We always buy our fruit and vegetables from them, and I've never known them not to have anything we need. But when we asked them if they had a pomegranate, they both shook their heads at us and told us to try the supermarket. So we walked up and over the hill to the supermarket. They had a fruit section that was as long as our house, but mum couldn't see a pomegranate anywhere. We went over to a man who was stacking carrots and humming to himself and asked him if they had any pomegranates in store. He walked us over to a small box, but it was empty. Sorry, love, looks like we've run out. You might want to try the biggest supermarket on the other side of town. 
Ah, oh, OK, thank you. Mum looked down at me inside, then she said, come on, the adventure continues. We hopped on a bus and after about half an hour, landed at an even bigger supermarket. This one had a car park as big as a football field and corridors as long as the ones in school, but we still couldn't find a pomegranate anywhere. Let's have someone, said Mum. They must have them. We walked around and found a man dressed in a suit who was standing by the sandwich station. He had a label on his jacket that said, Frank Smith, floor manager. I didn't know what a floor manager was, but I guess he had to make sure the floor was clean and help anyone who fell down get back up again. But Mr Smith didn't look like the kind of person who would help anyone get up from the floor. He had lips that went downwards as if they never smiled and his hair looked wet as if a large bottle of oil had fallen on top of it. He was staring at a clipboard and muttering angrily to himself. Excuse me, Frank is it? Hi, said Mum smiling. The man gave my mum a cold nod before continuing to fill in his form. We're looking for some pomegranates, but I can't seem to find any, said Mum, smiling even more. We don't sell them here, said Frank, still looking at his clipboard. Oh, really? Any idea where we could find some, continued Mum. No. My mum looked at him for a few seconds and then said in her warmest voice, Thank you. You've really outdone yourself in helping us today. Have a wonderful day. And grabbing my hand, she walked away. Mum, why were you so nice to my ass? He was horrible. He didn't try and help us even a little bit. Because you should never be horrible to someone who's been horrible to you, said Mum. Otherwise, they may win by making you just as bad as them. Now, come on, let's get back on the bus. There's another place I know we can try. By this time, I was getting hungry. So while we were waiting for the next bus, I ate my banana. Hmm, said my mum, looking at her watch. It was nearly two o'clock and there were some dark grey clouds gathering in the sky. I'm afraid the next stop will have to be our last one, darling. It looks like it's going to start raining in a bit. A few seconds later, a very full bus pulled up in front of us and we squeezed on. I clung to mum's coat because there weren't any empty seats and waited for our stop. I was worried because if this was our last try, then I had just one last chance to find a pomegranate. So I crossed my fingers and my toes and made a wish that we would. The next place felt like an awfully long way away and when we finally got there it was filled with so many people that we could hardly walk properly. There were lots and lots of market stalls laying in the middle of a big road all selling fish and meat and bed sheets and long gold chains. There was a man with a microphone who was trying to sell perfumes like a game show host by shouting roll up roll up and next to him was a woman shouting Peter never picked potatoes as good as these before buy them now before they go. I wondered who Peter was and how much money he made picking potatoes. Then I could smell onions and burgers being cooked somewhere, which made my tummy rumble. I love burgers, especially ones that have lots of fried onions and ketchup in them. But I wanted to save my money for the pomegranates, so I scrunched up my nose and tried not to smell anything at all. We visited every stall in the market, from the beginning of the high street to the end. But even though we looked as carefully as we could, we couldn't find a single pomegranate anywhere. My mum had told me to look for a pinkish ball that looked like a very hard apple which had a small crown on the top but I couldn't see anything that looked even a little bit royal. Try the store by the station, suggested one of the stall owners when mum asked for her help. They have everything under the sun in there, they should have some. Thank you, said mum. She grabbed my hand and gave it a squeeze because she could tell I was starting to give up hope. Nearly there, she whispered. I can feel it. We walked for five minutes down the road and up to the station and found the shop the woman in the market had told us about. It was much smaller than the big supermarket with Frank the horrible floor manager in, but it was bright with lots of coloured lights and bowls and bowls of fruit and vegetables outside. He had everything you could think of, peaches and plums, mangoes and bananas, kiwis and pears, yellow apples and red apples and pink apples, and even a spiky pink and green fruit that I had never seen before. But we couldn't see any pomegranates, so we went inside and mum asked the man standing behind the counter. Ah, nodded the man, scratching the tip of his nose. Pomegranate, I see for you. And talking out loudly to himself, he hurried to a corner of the shop and quickly looked through some boxes. Much, much regret, he called out, holding up an empty box. No more, but we have delivery on Tuesday. The man came back and looked at us and we looked at him. He had a large white beard and moustache that was curly at the ends and was wearing a bright red turban. I liked him because his eyebrows were like hairy caterpillars and they jumped up and down when he spoke. Oh well, said Mum, we tried at least. The man looked at me. I think he must have noticed look, that I was sad because he said, it is for the little one. I looked and nodded up and for my friend, I said. He is new in my class and he misses home and that's what he used to have. I see, he said, looking at me with a smile. Then he frowned as if he'd just thought of something and suddenly pointing his finger at the ceiling and crying out, aha. He ran to a small door at the back of the shop and disappeared. Mum and I looked at each other in surprise. He's funny, he said. I like him. He seems lovely, agreed Mum. 
and after a few seconds the man came back but instead of returning to the counter he came and stood in front of us they are not perfect we'll be okay he said and whipping his hands out from behind his back he held up two little pink balls that each had a crown on top oh cried out mum clapping her hands you have some they are a little old my wife she says they are not perfect 100 percent, so we don't sell you see my wife she knows everything about fruit so i listen to her most they're perfect enough for us laughed mum aren't they darling i nodded as the man gently handed them to me you and friend enjoy please he whispered and tapped me on the nose with a finger that had a golden ring with a large stone set on it i looked down at the pomegranates they were the size of grapefruits and had a hard peachy pink and brown skin that was smooth and as shiny as polished glass and both of them had a tiny flower on the top made up of exactly seven stiff brown petals they were the best most interesting things i'd ever seen mum took out her purse because that's where i'd put my pocket money but the man shook his head and waved his hand no no you must not it is a gift for the little one. Oh no you must let me but the man held up his hand which made mum go quiet and then put his hand on his chest it is gift they are not excellent not new so very poor gift they are the best gifts said mum aren't they darling i nodded feeling so happy that i wanted to hug the man and mum and jump up and down all at once thank you sir i said giving the man an enormous smile welcome welcome he said and smiling back he gave me a pat on the top of my head and waved at us as we left the shop what a wonderful man said mum as she helped me put the pomegranates in my rucksack he looked like a king i said thinking of the ring with the stone in it and his red turban mum laughed he certainly has the heart of one maybe he is one you can never tell with people seeing as our unexpected adventure is at an end let's hurry home before it starts to pour i looked up everything had suddenly turned dark and the sky was filling with large grey clouds that were so low you could hear them rumbling but i didn't care because i had two of the best presents i could ever have in my bag given to me by a man with the heart of the king which is an absolutely lovely ending to the chapter isn't it but as a reader i know that weather often signals a change in moods come in so even though the narrator is really happy as a reader i'm starting to wonder if something bad is going to happen um, in the next chapter particularly with the pomegranates okay so what i want you to do for today's independent activity is i want you to pick answers straight from the text to these questions okay so what I want you to do when you're using or when you're answering retrieval questions, it is useful to use quotes so evidence from the chapter to help us evidence your answers. OK, so let's have a look at an example. So why was the narrator so keen to speak to their mum on a Sunday morning? Use words that you find in the passage. OK, so the narrator was so keen to speak to their mum on the Sunday morning because, yeah, um, so what is your evidence there? So they're clearly excited because they want to know the answers to the 11 questions. So that's me using evidence in my answers. So the narrator was keen to speak to the mum on a Sunday morning as they wanted to know more answers to the 11 questions. So I've quoted the text in my answer. So what I would like you to do is to answer these four questions. They're in your booklet as well. So have a go at answering the retrieval questions using quotes or words from the chapter to evidence your answer. So look back into the text to find your supporting evidence. So remember, you must write in full sentences with proper punctuation. Okay, and that ends today's session. Thank you very much.